This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 325 was recorded on May 26th, 2022. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode of Macro Voices was brought to you by farmtogether.com, where you can hedge against inflation and protect your portfolio by investing in U.S. farmland, now available to all accredited investors. Variant Perception CEO and Head of Market Research, Tian Yang, returns as this week's feature interview guest. We'll go through Variant Perception's latest leading economic indicator research and discuss whether the current equity route signals an oncoming recession or if it's just a mid-cycle pullback. Then be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment when I'll give you my analysis of the monkeypox scare and why I'm not overly concerned about it escalating into another pandemic. Then we'll dive into Patrick's chart deck, which will be titled, What's Next for Markets? And I'm Patrick Serezna. Eric, let's dive into the S&P 500. I mean, right after last week's uh, show, we had uh, the market basically break down, make a a, a fresh new intraday low, but didn't close at a lower low. And really, uh, we uh, have spent so far most of the week uh, crawling higher, and uh, suddenly we're back uh, above 4,000, heading toward 4,100. We're at 4,062 at the time of recording. Uh, What are you thinking here on the S&P? Well, as you said, when we saw that breakdown to a new lower low after last week's show, I was thinking, oh boy, it seems like the the bear market really is on. I think what has changed everything this week is the Fed minutes coming out. Everybody's excited because they think that yesterday's Fed minutes imply that the Fed is going to be done with its hiking cycle after three more 50 basis point hikes. Um, Honestly, I think that's reading a fair amount of meaning into those Fed minutes. I'm not sure if all that meaning is really there or not. So for now, the reason I believe that the market is rallying fairly sharply this morning on Thursday is that we do have this expectation that, okay, the Fed hiking cycle is going to end in a few more meetings and you know it's all going to be over. I don't think that's the right way to look at this. The Fed is going to respond to inflation. If inflation is still running rampant after those three hikes, then regardless of what this month's minutes said, they're going to continue with their hiking cycle if they need to. On the other hand, if three more hikes really is enough to get inflation completely under control, then sure, I I guess that would mean that perhaps we've now seen the bottom in this uh, short-lived bear market, and it's all uphill from here. But frankly, I'm not persuaded that that's the case. So I think that this is for sure fuel for a good, strong bounce. We've been asking for the last few weeks, what's the catalyst going to be to get a bear market rally going, even if it's not the real bottom? Well, I think we've got that signal at this point. Is it really the bottom, or is it just a, uh, a vigorous bounce that's not going to last as people realize that they were reading too much into those Fed minutes? Well, I guess we'll find out. Well, let's move on to the dollar index because it was two weeks ago, uh, we, uh, just as we were recording this episode, that the dollar index punched to a higher high above the 104 level and uh, lasted there uh, like literally half a day. And since then, we've been two weeks of the dollar just backfilling and and pulling back. We're under 102 right now, 101.88 at the time of recording. Is a short-term top in uh, the dollar for in your mind? Well, Patrick, you're the technician in the house, so I'd love your feedback on the technical analysis aspects of this. But the way I see it is that was a very important five-year high at 104 spot, whatever it was. We got back to, I guess it was actually over it by just a tiny bit, but for all intents and purposes, it was a retest of that high. And now what we're seeing is the market is filling in. We're seeing a little bit of consolidation, which I would think is just a perfectly normal expansion. You know, they call them resistance levels for a reason. They resist it first before you break through them. So as long as we stay above 99, which was the prior resistance level before we got this move up to 104, I think it's just a pullback. Now, longer term, I think that Luke Groman's view that the dollar is going to lose hegemony over the global financial system and lose its reserve status is spot on. But I think that's toward the end of this decade, not not right now. I want to know what your take is, though, on this pullback 
back in the dollar. I see it as a perfectly normal, healthy uh, hesitation before we eventually move to new higher highs because, you know, we're trying to break through a five-year resistance level. That's a big deal. What's your take? Well, Eric, I uh, have to, in principle, agree with you. The thing is, there's zero evidence that this dollar uptrend is over. The only thing that we've seen was a very short-term overshoot that is now mean reverting and uh, correcting the typical action that you would see. I think uh, what is going to be really important to me is to see whether or not the dollar index gets bought on dip and whether it can hold above 100, 101 uh, during little pullbacks. If the consolidation uh, stays contained, then a resumption of the bull trend uh, later this summer is entirely on the table. Uh, it's certainly one of the bigger macro uh, puzzles to solve uh, going into the next few months. Anyway, uh, let's move on to crude oil because uh, I'm looking at this chart and uh, uh, a little breakout uh, today to 114 uh, broke uh, several weak highs now and uh, looking like it's uh, ready to go. Is uh, uh, another leg of the bull run uh, starting here in, on crude in your mind? Patrick, let's start with EIA inventory. Now, the headline number for crude oil was a drawdown of a million barrels, which is significant. But what's much more significant is the real number was 7 million barrels because 6 million barrels was drawn down out of the SPR. That gets reported in a different column. So if you include the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in the equation, the real crude oil drawdown was 7 million barrels this week. A million barrels of that came out of Cushing, Oklahoma. That is, of course, where the futures contract is settled and it's really, really running low on oil, especially as we're just starting to come into high demand season in the summertime. Gasoline drew down a half a million barrels. Distillates building 1.7 million barrels. That was the only build on the board this week. Now, early spring is supposed to be restocking season. And although, frankly, at this point, we're kind of at the end of or past restocking season, we've drawn down gasoline stocks for 16 of the last 17 weeks. So there was no restocking of gasoline. There hasn't been much restocking of crude oil. This week, we had a net drawdown of 5.8 million barrels, including both crude oil and finished products, if you include that SPR drawdown. U.S. production remained flat at 11.9 million barrels. The strong move up today appears to have been catalyzed by OPEC Plus confirming that they're going to stand pat on their production targets. Now, hold on a minute. Targets? Since when does OPEC have production targets? They used to be called production quotas back when OPEC itself had confidence that their members were going to be able to at least hit those quotas if they didn't cheat and exceed them. Now they've started calling them targets instead of quotas. Isn't that interesting? I have been ridiculed, as our listeners know, for saying that OPEC was out of spare capacity. Last week, Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman kind of took my side of that argument but his statements were kind of vague, not too committal. This week, Aramco's CEO made much stronger statements, saying that the world is down to about 2% spare capacity and confirming my view that we are out of spare capacity, which could potentially mean a really big move up in prices. Remember that crude oil is a famously price inelastic commodity to demand, which is just a fancy way of saying when the price goes up, it doesn't really cause demand to come off that much. Discretionary leisure travel tends to be affected by higher prices, but most of the uses of crude oil are uses that have to happen in order to keep the economy going. And as we're seeing a resumption of demand for jet fuel with all of the travel restrictions from the COVID crisis coming out of the equation, that's probably going to be what pushes us to the point where we're not just out of spare capacity, but we're at the point where we just can't produce enough oil. It was easy to see all of this coming, and it's been exacerbated by policy. Most of the market is not pricing in or expecting a U.S. recession. Now, For the moment, it seems like a lot of people think that the Fed is already blinking and is going to back away from its hiking cycle. I'm not completely persuaded of that yet. But if we get a U.S. recession, as we've been talking with about some of our guests, that ought to be a catalyst for a dip. But frankly, even if there's a dip, I think that all of these uh, bullish factors are really going to come and nail us before the summer is over. So I won't be surprised if we see new all-time highs above $147. I really, really want to get Dr. Anas Alhaji back on the show. We're trying to get him booked sometime in June. 
Anas is one of the smartest people I know in the oil industry. He's a, a sought-after keynote speaker at all of the best conferences. He sees the spare capacity way the same way that I do. But to my complete surprise, Anas doesn't think that oil prices are going dramatically higher from here. He thinks they may only have a little bit higher to go. I don't really understand why he's saying that, and I'm really looking forward to getting him on the show. So look for that in coming weeks. Well, uh, I'm looking forward to him coming back on the show too. So let's move on though to gold because gold obviously has bounced. The dollar pressure is off of it and uh, it uh, was quite oversold down to a support line, but uh, really hasn't been that impressive of a rally. We're sitting right around 1850 at the time of recording. Uh, Do you think it's just going to be more of a grind for gold from here? Well, we did have one, two, three, four, five green candles in a row on the daily chart. So a little pullback for a couple of days, which is all we've seen so far, makes perfect sense. But frankly, I think this pullback needs to end where it already is. Because if we get back below 1830, that's going to take out the short-term moving averages. That's going to move us back below Ola Hansen's long-term trend support line. And it's really going to bring some question into my mind as to where this is headed. Now, if the people who think that the Fed is backing away from its uh, hawkish policy because of these Fed minutes turn out to be right, that could fuel further strength in the gold market. So we'll see what happens here. But I think it's really important to watch this. If we get a drop below 1830, and especially if we get back below 1800, I really start to get concerned. The other thing that I would really get concerned about is regardless of the fundamentals, we know from the experience of 2008, when the gold fundamentals were just incredibly bullish, that if there's going to be a full on stock market crash where you see retail capitulation, in the market. If that happens, and I'm definitely going to ask Tian Yang about that in today's feature interview, if that happens, gold's going to sell off with everything else because in a market crash, you you sell what you have to sell, not what you want to sell. And that could uh, take us down quite a bit lower. So we'll see what happens. But I think there is a good argument that the, the bottom is already in. But this rally needs to hold. And right now it's starting to waver. Now we're going to work on a gold centric show for next week. So stay tuned for that. All right. Well, let's uh, uh, wrap up with touching on the 10-year Treasury yield. Uh, Really, uh, after uh, March and April, were uh, just a devastating bear move as the rates were uh, rocketing, almost doubled. And really, the last two weeks, almost a month, has really been uh, yields just kind of being quiet and slowly crawling lower. We're at 275 at the time of recording. Uh, Have we seen a a a short to intermediate high on uh, yields in your mind? Well, Patrick, that's the $64 trillion question. And if we stay below 3%, I think the result is going to be that the Fed and other market participants are going to say, okay, maybe this inflation thing is starting to come under control. We're not going to expect the Fed to be so hawkish that, uh, you know, kind of changes things. On the other hand, if we did get a breakout substantially above 3%, I think that would force the Fed to take a much more hawkish stance and and, and further hike short-term rates. So there's kind of a chicken and egg problem there. My overall take, though, is I don't have any predictions about this market. I I watch it very, very carefully because it's an incredibly important macro signal. But as far as predicting what comes next, I don't know. Well, this week's feature interview guest is Variant Perceptions Research Chief Tian Yang. Eric, why did we get Tian back on the show this week? Well, as our listeners know, I've been saying for weeks that I'm convinced the Fed is trying to intentionally engineer a recession, and I think they'll be successful at that. Uh, Of course, some people would say that the Fed minutes contradict that. I don't quite agree with them on that. But okay, here's the thing. That's a thematic view. That's kind of the way I think about macro is big picture, you know, try to fit the pieces of the puzzle together. What I really respect, though, is people whose analysis is driven by hard data. And I don't have the ability to do the original research necessary to really support some of my views. So I look to research like Variant Perception to tell me what's really going on in the data to find out whether it jibes with my macro views. Variant Perception's graphs and charts, and particularly their leading economic indicator work is some of the best in the business. So I wanted to get them back on the show in order to give us an update and see how the data jibes with the thematic view that I've expressed for the last several weeks on the show. Eric's interview with Tian Yang is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. With inflation reaching a 40-year high, investors are looking toward real assets to help safeguard their portfolio. 
One asset is rising in popularity. Farmland has consistently provided returns more than double the inflation rate since before 1992. How? Because farmland's value is underpinned by its critical role in the global economy. The country's growing population needs to eat. Farmland is well positioned to maintain its value over time, no matter the economic condition. As the supply of arable land in the United States shrinks each year, high quality farmland should only become that much more valuable in the long run. Interested in adding farmland to your portfolio? Head to farmtogether.com. Farm Together is tapping into the nearly $3 trillion U.S. farmland market to bring unparalleled access to institutional quality farmland through a variety of products, including crowdfunded farmland offerings, 1031 exchange, sole ownership bespoke offerings, and most recently, the Sustainable Farmland Fund. Check out farmtogether.com today. You'll be glad you did. And now, with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Variant Perception's Tian Young. Tian is still head of research, but has also taken over the CEO position. So congratulations on that, Tian. Yeah, thanks a lot, Eric. Uh, great to be back on Macro Voices. Variant Perception Research is some of the best in the industry, and Tian's colleagues at Variant Perception were kind enough to share with us the May 5th Leading Indicator Watch. Now, out of respect for Variant Perception's paying uh, subscribers, that is a few weeks old, so it's dated, but still very much relevant. Tian, I really want to dive into this because, you know, my take has been I think the Fed is intentionally trying to engineer a recession, but frankly, I'm not nearly as data-driven as I should be. So let's dive into the data. Listeners, you'll find the download link for that May 5th leading indicator watch in your research roundup email. If you don't have a research roundup email, just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com. Click the red button that says looking for the downloads. Tian, let's dive into this and talk about what's going on data-wise. Are we looking at just a, a little blip here or is this a recession coming our way? Yeah, um, that, that's clearly the kind of top of mind question for investors right now. We try to measure the business cycle in a hopefully objective way. And so, um, you know, often when we think about recessions and business cycle, we're often trying to incorporate both kind of soft financial market data, survey data, as well as the hard kind of economic data, right? You know, the, the raw kind of real economic data and combining the two. So overall, when we look at our models in terms of the cycle, we th we're still more leaning towards a mid-cycle slowdown right now as of what we can see in the data. Um, the, the kind of really bad inputs are things linked to liquidity. So as you say, you know, the Fed's clearly tightening financial conditions, you know, straining excess liquidity from the system. You know, a lot of indicators we track like BCFI, which is a diffusion of global central bank policy. That's very bad. So the liquidity front is very bad. However, in terms of the hard economic data, it is slowing, but it's not quite at levels you typically see going into a recession. So typically going into recession, you tend to see kind of a major drop in building permits say, you know, up to six months ahead of time, you tend to see kind of a huge surging initial claims off the lows. And so some of these things are starting to slow a little bit, but we're not quite there. So I think as of right now, I, th I think we're still probably more thinking it's more of a mid-cycle slowdown than an outright recession. But obviously, what, what we need to do is essentially, you know, let the data evolve and just see how it plays out. Tian, let's dive into some of the major points in this May 5th report. Uh, looking at page one, you start out by saying, with the Fed's meeting behind us, the bond and equity roadmaps are still looking for evidence that CPI has peaked before you would recommend adding duration. And you go on to talk a little bit more. Tell us where that stands. What's your outlook? How do you see this right now? Yeah, so, so this is where I think we're getting, getting close to the point of inflection. Um, our lead indicators have been pointing to the March CPI print as the peak, and obviously the April print was slightly um, lower, right? But obviously surprise on the upside, but generally slightly lower. And so based on our models, the May print should hopefully confirm that inflation has peaked. So I think as long as the inflation peak is in, given a lot of the technicals around how bonds trade, right? Like we're into the seasonal period of the year where bonds tend to rally, i.e. yields tend to come off. So potentially a lot of things are lining up to target kind of June as a time when we would probably start getting a lot more comfortable looking to, to buy dips on duration and, and get long. You know, a lot of the trading models we have on it, like the LPPL models, have all kind of basically played out, right? It's targeting kind of beginning of June as when the crash period is over. 
So, so that, that's kind of roughly, roughly the plan right now. So as long as we see the, the May CPI print confirm the, the peak again, then you know, I think that that'll be a pretty good um, entry point, it feels like. Now, when you talk about confirming a peak, is your view that this whole inflation experience has been a result of COVID-related supply chain issues and therefore is likely to be entirely transitory? Or are we talking about just an interim peak before the next cycle maybe goes higher? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I, I mean, I think that the, the truth is always somewhere in between, isn't it? It's, it's not probably 100% one or the other. I do think the general level inflation is higher going forwards, just because you're going to have a lot of the structural factors, you know, like globalization, right, US-China tension, all these factors that had helped facilitate lower inflation, those are gone. But clearly, the, the COVID, you know, the supply chain disruptions, the China lockdown, all these things have had an impact in the short term on inflation pressures. So those are obviously starting to go away. And obviously, as the Fed tightens, naturally, you know, some of the steam will come out of housing and so forth. So you won't get as much of a kind of upward momentum in inflation. You know, it doesn't mean we're going back to 2% anytime soon. So I think in terms of equity Fed put, we're, you know, we're still quite far away. But, you know, in terms of how bonds are likely to trade, I think as long as the second derivative turns negative, that there's probably quite a good, um, quite a good opportunity to position and trade there. Now, global liquidity and growth indicators are still deteriorating. So it seems like we're, we're not to the bottom quite yet. Yeah, no, no, I, I'm with you there. I think, um, you know, generally speaking, to, for you to be max bold up, you know, levered up long, you really want to have both growth and liquidity kind of tailwinds behind you. And unfortunately, right now, we're still kind of working through some of the lagged effects from even the, the hikes around the world that, that went in last year, right? Obviously, a lot of EM central banks aggressively kind of preloaded hikes. And obviously, this year, all the, all the DM central banks are obviously hiking as well. So yeah, I, I would say in terms of the, the six-month outlook, both growth and liquidity-wise, it still looks pretty bad. I mean, the, the, literally, the only good point right now is that our recession model, which is the kind of one-zero regime switch model, that hasn't triggered. So, you, you know, this is probably... A mid cycle slowdown, a la kind of 2012, 2018. It, it, you know, obviously we've seen the, the S and P crash. It is ugly, but it probably won't turn into a an 08 style ugly, um, at, at least according to our models right now. Okay, but U.S. leading indicators are rolling over per your own research. So what does that tell us? Um, well, I think a, a growth slowdown doesn't necessarily mean a recession. So what's very interesting is if you run, say, analogs of how the price action economic data look. The closest one you can come up with is actually 1984, and and this is really interesting, right? So in 19, so so if I didn't tell you it was 1984, and I just described it as you know equity markets peaked at the year before and it had a big drawdown, you know bond markets were selling off, yields were surging because there was a big inflation scare, right? That that kind of describes this year pretty well, right? And that was 1984, kind of you know beginning of the year March, and then what you had was you had inflation very quickly peak and roll over which with a slight lag allowed bond yields to come off. And they eventually by kind of September, equity markets had bottomed out. And it's really interesting. I went back and read some of the New York Times articles around that. And again, you can just see even back then, there was a lot of talk about, you know, essentially the Fed put, right? There was lots of talk about the market will turn when, when the Fed intervenes. So, so it's interesting to see that not that much changes um, over time. So I feel like that's probably a more interesting analogy today. So it doesn't mean the equity sell-off is over, over. But, um, you know, it, it probably gives slightly more, slightly more comfort than, you know, that this is, say, 2001, 2008 with a major, major kind of crash ahead of us. Now, a lot of analysts have suggested that the thing to watch is China's recovery because, you know, we have the luxury in North America of having better vaccines. We, we've kind of gotten out of lockdown mode. China is just barely coming out of lockdown mode. The, the Shanghai lockdowns just ending a week ago. Uh, what are the data telling us? Is, is the, uh, the pain for China over? Or are we about to see a recovery there? Not really. I, I'll probably describe it as more that we're seeing the L shape. And it's trying to bounce a little bit, but it's not really bounced. You know, the, the rhetoric has probably been a lot more aggressive than the actual policy actions. For all the talk about ending the kind of regulatory crackdown, all the talk about supporting the economy, you know, 5.5% GDP target, there's been very little in the leading data. I think all, we, all we've seen is things have stopped getting worse, but it's not, it's not really get, getting better, unfortunately. Let's talk about LEIs in the Eurozone. Yeah, so I think Europe... Obviously, with, with the Ukraine war and, and the energy shock, um, this is a situation where the LEI is probably painting a slightly more optimistic picture than the actual underlying, which is saying something because the LEI is also pretty bad. 
So, you know, we're, we're probably on the verge of a recession in Europe if we're not in one already. I mean, that there's things you can look at, for example, the zoo economic expectations survey, right? Like that, that's basically so low that every single previous time we hit the level, it's been recessionary. So, you know, the ECB seemed pretty determined to focus on inflation and hike. So, you know, Europe looks um, extremely vulnerable right now. Now, the last time that I had you on Macro Voices, we talked about your thesis for a new commodity super cycle. Well, boy, you nailed that one. But it feels like maybe uh, we're running out of steam or at least taking a breather here. What's going on? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I would say um, a lot of the structural, you know, long term five year plus factors we talked about back then are still valid. So, you know, a lot of the supply constraints, right, the, the capital scarcity, the shift towards inflation, you know, commodities and asset class, those are still valid. But unfortunately, a lot of the shorter term cyclical indicators and the tactical indicators are now saying we're probably due for intermission. So, you know, if you even go back to look at the early 2000s super cycle, it wasn't necessarily, you know, a straight line throughout, right? You still have periods like, you know, Q4 of 2004, second half of 2006, where essentially you trade sideways with extreme volatility um, up and down. And so it seems to us we're more, you know, trending towards that kind of, um, that kind of a setup right, right now. And obviously, if you, just, if you just Google super cycle, right, like most people are talking about it now. So, you know, this isn't that contrary anymore, right? There's probably better opportunities. So we're probably going to wait if our global lead indicators for growth for liquidity start to bottom and turn up, you know, if the China LAI turns up, then yeah, maybe that'll be the time to get back in on the commodity super cycle play. But yeah, for now, I would probably characterize it as, a, um, as an intermission. Now, energy, of course, has done extremely well. I expect it to continue to do well. Uh, I've fortunately been involved in that market, but I kind of missed this super cycle in terms of copper and other commodities. Sometimes commodity cycles and equity cycles don't really line up in terms of their timing. So with respect to the things I missed that I'd like to buy the low in when, when they, they eventually hit their bottom, uh, do I want to look at something like copper as uh, coming before? Were the bottom in equities after the bottom in equities? How should I think about this? Mm, but by the way, I, I'm I'm fully with you on the energy, right? I still, I still think energy setup is probably the best. But I, I would say right now we are in the phase where, because of, of all the uncertainty around China, you probably don't want to jump jump the gun too much, right? Like I think if I reflect back on the history of EP and things we've done well and badly, the the, the, the mistakes, a lot of the the, the the mistakes that stand out to me are when we've overridden kind of our excess liquidity indicators, right? Like try to turn too bullish before the liquidity conditions justified it. And so I think this time around, it's probably most important to try and avoid that, to let, let the liquidity picture play out, let it stabilize, let it turn up. Because even then, if you buy, say, even 20% off the lows, you, you'll feel so much more confident kind of chasing it, you know, lifting offers on the right-hand side and, and knowing you're going to have that runway. Whereas I think the challenge before that in terms of getting long is, you know, that there's, there's plenty of good news priced in, right? I, I think that's the challenge right now. Tian, I just love the graphs and charts in your report, and I strongly encourage our listeners to download this and peruse the entire thing because it's, it's really terrific content. We don't have time to cover every single bit of it, so let's skip ahead to page five because I want to talk particularly about inflation. Uh, as we look at these charts here, how do we know when we get to a peak? How do we know whether the peak is a short-term peak or a long-term peak? What is this telling us, and what can you uh, do to expand our understanding of this inflation situation? Yeah, sure. So in general, in a quote unquote normal business cycle, um, inflation tends to be one of the most lagging indicators. So it tends to reliably lag the move in kind of growth two years earlier. And so if you look at a lot of the inputs that are going to our models, they generally, in terms of where we set the core anchor, it's a lot of things linked to that. So, you know, if you just look at kind of previous manufacturing activity, you look at previous employment, uh, temporary employment activity and so forth, that's kind of the anchor. Now, obviously, as we discussed earlier, this time around, there's so many kind of supply side shocks. So we need to capture things like commodity prices, ISM prices paid. And so when, when you put the two together, you, as you can see right now, we're mostly pointing towards a peak, a, a, a rolling over, but not necessarily the, the top price. So this is more like a, a plateau rather than, you know, you hit the peak of the mountain and, and it's kind of coming off. I, I think the, the one really interesting area right now will be in housing and shelter CPI. Um, you know, this is kind of basically the biggest weight for the U.S. basket, both core and, and the headline. And right now, given the surging mortgage rates and a lot of the housing data has been weakening, 
and that that typically has a pretty good reliable relationship to um to kind of shelter CPI. I, I think a lot of the market commentary people have been quite confused about shelter CPI because it underperformed so much kind of uh, last year and now it's surging higher. But actually, a lot of this is just basically to do with how the data is collected and some of the eviction moratoriums that had been affecting the um the kind of rent observed rent and implied rent component. So. You know, the fact that housing CPI underperformed so much in 2021 is, is basically very easy to explain because typically when people go out to collect the data for the, for the survey, they don't go survey all the kind of parts of the country at once, right? It takes some time to get through all the countries. So there's an inherent lag to reflect the changes in the data. And at the same time, because of the eviction moratoriums, even though asking rents were going higher, a lot of the actual realized rents did not. So you kind of had this undershoot. And now that moratorium is over, as the collection rates pick up, now you're kind of compensating for it with this overshoot in, in inflation. So, you know, this is basically going to come out of the data in the kind of next three, well, basically next three months, right? So, you know, as this comes out, then you would think that housing CPI kind of settles in, you know, it's still going to be high, but not at this crazy level. So then from here, I, I would imagine that the narrative of inflation really does move away and, and, we, and we kind of have more comfort around kind of peak inflation. And again, listeners, I'm going to recommend that everybody look at all of the terrific graphs and charts in this deck. But I want to move on now because, Tian, I think the the real bottom line here for everybody is, look, we've got this very significant sell-off in equity markets. To put it simply, the, the trick is to know when it's actually bottomed so you know when it's time to start buying that blood in the streets moment. Uh, it sounds like you don't think we're quite there yet, but maybe getting close. So how do you know? And what's the strategy that listeners can employ in order to manage risk in this environment? Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. You know, like, you know, the, the old adage, right? They, they, you know, they say they don't ring a bell at the top or the bottom. But, I, you know, I would like to reframe it a little bit as it might not be one bell, but let's say five bells. And, there's, and the five bells are basically different aspects of the economy and markets that you can go through almost kind of checklist style and tick off. And so we would probably frame it as essentially, you know, the five of the corporate activity, valuations, economic outlook, how the market is trading and sentiment, right? But that's kind of the five big buckets. And you can kind of work your way through each one to get a sense of, are you seeing the signs that typically are there at our market bottom? So for example, let's say corporate activity. Well, obviously we've seen with the kind of the SPAC IPO boom last year, right? That, or, or like, um, you know, beginning last year, that's over, right? Nowadays, the corporate activity is much more reflective what you would be seeing at market bottom, right? There's no IPO activity, you know, valuation is kind of coming off, VC funds are suddenly backing away. So for example, on the corporate front, you'll be like, okay, we're probably seeing, you know, seeing some signs that are needed at market bottom. Here, the missing pieces would be things like actually seeing some major bankruptcies on corporates and seeing some major hedge fund liquidations. And obviously, you know, in the news, we're, we're starting to see more kind of more of these hedge fund type liquidations, right? And maybe we'll see some big, high-profile corporate bankruptcies or distress as well, as, as typically what you see at a, a major kind of market bottom. Um, Valuation-wise, it's probably more mixed signal. Obviously, some parts of the market are cheaper than others. You know, housing is kind of priced for a really, you know, full-on recession, um, I would say. But overall, valuation is probably like a neutral. In terms of sentiment, yeah, for sure, we're kind of getting towards a pretty, pretty bad up environment, right? Like, you know, you just have to scan kind of news, talk to people, and like the sentiment is extremely bad right now. So I would say that probably fits. Market-wise, maybe we can get into this a little bit later on, but I think, yeah, in terms of how the market is trading, I think we're seeing more signs that would would be there at our bottom. But but here, I think it's really important to have have a framework and data. It's it's a bit like that kind of Lenin, Lenin quote about how, you know, there are decades where nothing happens and then there, there are weeks where decades happens, right? And and I think that the problem is during the bear market and the crash, you kind of you're, you're almost forced to shorten your time horizon and really pay attention to kind of what's driving the market tactically in terms of flows and positioning and vol markets and so forth. So so there I would say is kind of you know half half a tick right. You're, you're seeing you're seeing things, but not not everything. I, I would say that the major missing piece in the market bottom, and obviously we we kind of walk through a little bit with the LIW, is on the economic outlook front. Typically, what you see at our bottom is that the economic data, both in terms of hard economic data, has been terrible, and then central banks have been easing for a while. And obviously, we have the kind of exact opposite of that right now, where the economic data is only just kind of you know, starting to deteriorate, and central banks are still in you know, full hawkish mode. And so I think that that's the real challenge right now. Without that economic confirmation, it's not super obvious what's going to motivate the corporate activity to shift, right? Or what's going to motivate the sentiment to shift. And so without that, you're kind of just left with, 
you know, the only reason things are going to rally is because everybody gets bearish and there's no more sellers, right? I.e., this means you get, you know, sharp bear market rallies. But just because you get bear market rally doesn't mean it's a sustainable bottom to, to kind of really bet the farm on again. And I think that that's the challenge right now. Now, one of the views that I've had, and I admit that it's not well qualified with data, is, you know, it feels to me like this whole equity sell-off has been remarkably orderly, considering the magnitude on a percentage basis of where we are down almost 20% from the top. You know, I don't really see many signs of panic. We're we're trading in a fairly defined, steep, but still well-defined downsloping price channel. We're not getting too far away from the short-term moving averages. That suggests to me that the retail panic, that capitulation moment, hasn't happened yet uh, at all. Is there any way we can use data to to quantify that and, and either prove or disprove that idea? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and the data will confirm your view, right? I think, for example, like if we look at volatility markets, there's a number of signals you can extract from vol markets to confirm this kind of panic or stress. You know, typically, the changes in the VIX and the S&P are kind of two sides of the same coin, right? They're highly correlated. So when they diverge, that gives you actually a lot of information about what's going on. So we can build, say, cumulative advanced decline lines that track VIX outperformance or underperformance versus equities. And so typically what you will see at a bottom or in a, in a kind of panicky sell-off is actually VIX outperforms on the way down, right? Because that shows... When the market sells off, everybody panics, they bid a volatility, they buy insurance, and then you get that classic war of worry to, to kind of you know, squeeze the market. We have the opposite today. The VIX has been underperforming on the whole, whole kind of sell-off. So you know, there's not the kind of option market panic that you would normally see, right? And that's obviously, to your point, not the best sign. Um, that, you know, equally, you can extract signals by looking at, say, realized versus implied correlations. And again, you know, it, correlations are up a bit, but they're nowhere near kind of what you would really see at a major panic. So, yeah, like there, there's a number of things there that make you think, hmm, maybe we haven't really hit the, the big, big bottom yet. And obviously, anecdotally, the real big concern is that because this is a, a tech-led sell-off, so i.e. the market leader from the previous bull cycle, that, you know, the pain hasn't fully wound its way through. You haven't had the, the kind of cascade selling. You know, there's a lot of talk of that in terms of private sector and private market stuff, a lot of valuations on a lot of the tech previous hot areas haven't necessarily been marked down as much as the public. So I think there's a lot of reasons to think that there could be a, 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 a vol explosion coming, right? It's a bit like, um, you know, we always use kind of this analogy about volatility is a bit like forest fires, where if you rush to put out every little fire like central banks have been doing for so long, what you end up with is an incredibly dense, overgrown forest. So then when the central banks step back, and their fire starts, it's going to just suddenly burn like crazy, right? And burn, just burn everything. And obviously, we see in the news on California a lot. And I think that that's the that's the real worry, worry right now, where with central banks stepping back, you don't, you know, a small fire could really turn into a big one. Well, help me reconcile this, because it seems to me like uh, the way I would interpret a lot of what you just said is the this bear market hasn't even really begun yet in the sense of so far we're just seeing a little bit of orderly selling the the panic the 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 retail exit hasn't even started that means that there's much further to go to the downside but on the other hand i could also make the argument to say look what's been driving this sell-off has been the fed's tightening cycle something that most retail investors don't even understand so they're probably not going to panic based on that maybe we just have to go through the market's reaction to fed policy fed policy is changing Maybe that means this is the bottom and there's not going to be any panic because retail's not going to be involved in this bear market or it hasn't started to so far. How do I, how do I resolve that conundrum? Yeah. Um, so I guess the way I would frame it is that I would start off with our recession models. And again, because our recession models don't foresee an imminent US recession. So immediately I'm in the mindset of this is a mid-cycle slowdown, a 2018, 2012 style sell-off, right? So that naturally limits how much of a sell-off we can have. So I think that probably leans slightly more towards this isn't going to be a major, major crash, but clearly you know, the pain has been put in. So that's the first framing. Obviously, a lot will depend on whether the recession does come or not. And obviously, our models right now haven't. But by the way, our models actually work pretty well in real time for pretty much most of the past 10 years, right? And, and the key was actually avoiding a lot of the false positives and not panicking in 18 and, you know, in, in 12, you know, in 15, right? In these kind of situations. So, you know, let's put that as the context. But then the second point really comes back to probably the kind of landing call I gave earlier where, you know, what a lot of this is because it's a fluid environment, we really have to focus in on time horizons and be more responsive 
to the market, right? I mean, there's plenty of signs that are panicky. It's just the volatility market hasn't been, but there's some signs that, you know, for example, if you look at um, uh, cyclical versus defensive ETF flows, that's at a pretty contrary level, right? Typically markets rally. If you do like, you know, technical analysis, you do like the, you know, a, a DeMarc style count, we're going to count 13. So that there's reasons to suspect you'll get these short kind of um, bear market kind of sh- short squeeze kind of rallies. So that, that's why I think focusing in is, is a, probably still a good idea, right? Lighting up on risk and trying to manage it a little bit. In terms of the, the, the big picture, right, like where we really end up with kind of that major, major bear market, I think it, it will depend a lot on, on your views on recession and whether, whether that hits. Because obviously, if, if that hits, then you know, you're probably going to get that one last big panic leg down. And, and then from there, the Fed will blink, right? And the Fed put kicks in. So, so that, that's probably the, the playbook. John, let's come back to China, because it seems to me this is kind of pivotal. China is the supplier of a lot of stuff that the world is running out of. And if they're going to end their lockdowns and very quickly ramp back up to full production and still want to sell things to the West, well, gee, maybe, you know, we just uh, managed to get off easy and, and everything's about to turn up rosy from here. On the other hand, it seems to me like if China continues to have difficulty restarting their economy, the dependent on China that the rest of the world has is really going to start to back up and, and bite us. How do we make sense of this? How can we figure out what's actually happening? So I, I would frame it as, you know, zero COVID supremacy, right? That, that's still the key. In China, zero COVID remains the top priority policy choice. So that's the context in which to think about other lead indicators, you know, other announcements. And unfortunately, on the zero COVID front, to your earlier point, that that's going to be a problem for you know, probably a while longer, right? Like China's domestic mRNA vaccines have not been, uh, have not been a su- very successful. Obviously, with a country that big with so many people, and given the tensions with the US, they're not going to buy US mRNA vaccines. So, you know, if they don't have it, and they're not willing to buy it, then what are they going to do, right? You know, obviously, they're trying to make their own, but it's, it's not happening. It's, it's not easy. So I think that that's the problem. I think for listeners, it might be worth appreciating that it does look crazy in terms of what they're doing with just obviously th- these are genuine like prison style lockdowns, right? Like, you know, we're talking about you're being told to keep your keys in your door so people can come around and like disinfect your house, right? And like literally gates going up over your front door. I mean, it's, it's, it's dystopian um, fr- from kind of where we're sat in, in the West. But the context in which why I think they're so obsessed and so freaked out about it is because in China, you know, it is getting to be a more of an aging population. There's a, there's a huge number of kind of older people who have not been vaccinated for one, one reason or another. So if you just apply like even a 0.1 or like in the, in the West, like 0.1, 0.2% death rate, you're going to get a huge absolute number of deaths, right, linked to COVID. And that could potentially destabilize the regime. So I think that might be one angle in which to think about it in terms of why they're doing these things that makes pretty much no economic sense. So yeah, in my mind, it's like, when are they going to abandon zero COVID? Well, you need her, her immunity. How do you get herd immunity without just killing a bunch of, you know, a, a serious amount of old people? Then you, probably you need to have a good vaccine program. How do you do that? Well, you know, they, they, they're going to need to make their own mRNA. And also they're obviously going to probably triple dose or quadruple dose, you know, everyone with, with whatever the Sinovac is, right? So I think until that happens, the rest of the things probably give you a sense of the potential for a rebound in China, but it, it probably won't be realized until until they step back, right? Like it's, it is, it is shocking to me how bad sentiment is. Obviously, you know, I have some connections there. I speak to friends, you know, family, people there, you know, who've been in Shanghai, other places. And I would never have imagined just how bearish and pessimistic people have been through this. Like, it is truly shocking to me. John, let's come back to commodities and specifically something I think quite a bit about is, you know, the the whole Western world is telling Russia, OK, we're going to put you in your place. We are done with buying your oil and your gas and, you know, Russia the heck with you. That's easy to say when you're the EU and you're grandstanding for for political approval in May. It's a much harder thing to say in October when the weather's about to turn. And, you know, the president of the United States says, don't worry, we're going to supply Europe with all the natural gas they need. And it's like, wait a minute, 
how are we going to do that? We don't have the export terminals. We don't have the LNG ships to do that. Even you know, Bloomberg, the day after he said that, said, where's that gas going to come from? Nobody's answered that question. So it seems to me that the recipe exists for an absolute economic crisis to occur in Europe toward the, the second half is they realize, wait a minute, we, we, we already, you know, basically flipped the bird to Russia and said, we're never buying any more of your gas. And now we don't have a second source and the weather's about to turn cold. What are we going to do? Am I wrong to think that that's a real risk? And how should I think more broadly about this conflict between Russia and I think also China and the West and what it might mean for commodity supply chains? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you're 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 hundred percent right, right. I mean, this is the the big kind of tail risk. It's funny you were talking about the politics, and I was just thinking to myself, you know, this is like the promises made, promises kept kind of joke, right? Like a lot of promises are made, and it's it's hard to keep. I, I guess the, the the hard thing to know is exactly how to position for this, because you know, there's a lot of kind of issues with with how how you actually deliver stuff, right? In terms of the pipelines, the infrastructure, the sh- whether the ships are available, um, and so. And obviously, these things are, can shift quickly. So I think from my, my mind, there's a few kind of key actionable takeaways from this, right? One is that commodity producers within the Western sphere of influence, I mean, they're going to be big beneficiaries, right? If you're Canada, if you're Australia, you know, you're going to be able to demand a serious premium for your things because Europe and US collectively, you know, they're going to come to you, right? So I think that's a fairly clear takeaway the other takeaway is that you know obviously countries like china will will be big big beneficiaries right you know they're going to be buying russian commodities hands over fist and try and you know build up all their reserves and inventories as, you know, and that that's going to be like an ongoing kind of shift in trade flows so that that probably is um is kind of the two more obvious things yeah but yeah the europe question i, I have no idea right i mean to your point i listened there was um like a month or two back there was um a, a podcast it was one of the german one of the, the CEOs, right, of, of one of the big German chemical companies. And they were saying, what are you going to do when Russia turns off the net gas? And he was just like, well, we'll just have to shut everything down, right? And then he's like, what's the implications? It means people are not going to have plastic bags in the supermarket, right? They're going to have mattresses or whatever, right? Just like it literally chemicals going to everything. And then, and then they were like, so do you support the, the political stance? And he was like, yes, right? He was like, we support the government. We'll work with the government to, um, to kind of reduce long-term impacts. Right. I, I think it's, it's just like it's it's a very different mindset. It, it feels like in terms of this collectivism against Russia in Europe that that, yeah, to your point, it's going to compound the problems. Right. Like everybody can see the problems coming and yet it still happens. And in a way, this is kind of almost like what we talked about with the original commodity super cycle. Right. It's not like people weren't talking about it. You know, we were aware. Right. ESG, all these things, there weren't enough you know, and en- energy, whatever, right, being produced because, you know, of all the limits. But you knew it was going to come back to buy it by us, right? And then it, it looks like it's a similar kind of setup again. John, let's talk about some of the tactical indicators that our listeners can watch in order to figure out where this is playing out. Because I think it's very clear from this conversation. It's basically, it looks like we could be getting close to a bottom unless the shit hits the fan, in which case all bets are off. Uh, we got to be able to qualify that with, okay, so what do you pay attention to in order to know whether or not the shit's hitting the fan? Yeah, absolutely. I think... Um, when you think about tactical trading, um, to us, we think a lot about flows and positioning and intermarket relationships. And then we're also trying to do some data mining on kind of previous price patterns, right, just to get a sense of what's going on. So I think, you know, from a flow point of view, it's pretty interesting that a lot of the indicators you would normally track is, is at pretty, you know, it's a pretty extreme levels, right? I, I mentioned kind of the cyclical versus defensive ETF flow previously. You know, that's at pretty extreme levels. Um, right now that historically the forward kind of return from here is pretty good you know one thing you can track is say the the um, close end funds so you can look at the the discount or or premium that close end funds are trading at relative to the nav so again when there's a panic on the stream people dump those shares they tend to trade at a big big discount to nav so there today like on our calculations you know they're trading probably like a five percent discount typically during a crisis you get to kind of ten percent plus so again we're not quite there but that'll be a good thing to track you know, we can use the kind of nice data on kind of cash and margin balances to proxy for buy flows into U.S. equity markets. And so you can like build that as a cumulative thing. So, you know, on our calculations, you kind of pretty much almost reverse the inflow since um, 2021. So, you know, pretty much most of the inflows that went into markets last year on, on that proxy is almost kind of out at this point. So, yeah, it's kind of saying to you, yeah, we're probably halfway or more than halfway done at least, right, in terms of the sell-off. 
you know, a lot of people who got along last year, they are out. And a lot of the contrarian signs you would need to see from a flow kind of point of view, it is there. The other things I mentioned in terms of, uh, in terms of some of the, uh, the sentiment into market relationships, I think one of the really clean but, but good indicators is to look at the stock bond ratio. So I say, you know, what, over the past month, how have stocks done relative to bonds? And what's that versus history? And today we're like a minus two standard deviation on that metric, right? It's like, you know, equities are seriously sold off relative to bonds. And typically that's actually a really nice, cute, contrarian, short-term trading indicator because usually there's a lot of mechanical rebalancing flows that flow from kind of big divergences in stock versus bond performance. You know, a lot of 60, 40s or, you know, these kind of people have to maintain stock versus bond ratios. Obviously, if one if stocks crash too much, then they're, they're forced to be kind of stock buyers a month end, right? And so obviously we're, we're recording this, you know, just after the uh, May expiry. So going to month end, you would think there's probably some kind of buy flow. And these are kind of things that can potentially set off a short squeeze. Back in March 2020, you know, it was kind of the rebalancing flow that kind of potentially started that that initial squeeze, right? So yeah, th- you know, those examples are some of the indicators that, you know, can be tracked to, le- to at least to get, um, get a good sense of, of what's going on for um, investors. Tian, there are times when one indicator works and there are other times when a different indicator works better. You guys follow so many different indicators. The, the question I've been dying to ask you is, okay, with respect to this year's market, not, not your favorite indicator overall, but with respect to what's working right now, what is the indicator that you've found has been most, uh, most true to, to its predictions? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I, I will probably frame it as two, right? One is in terms of the, the cyclical six months plus outlook and, and setting the scene for generally how you want to be positioned at global excess liquidity without a question, right? You need to know what the liquidity conditions are and whether it supports risk assets full stop. So I would say that's probably the most important um, kind of medium term indicator. In terms of short term trading wise, I think something that's worked extremely well this year is some of the kind of LPPL signals that we talked about, right? This is kind of, you know, based on the work that Didier Sonnet did on why markets crash. It's sort of capturing a lot of social dynamics, you know, how information spreads through the market. And, you know, this, you know, for example, back in January, this predicted kind of the tech crash, right? Like January 11, people was kind of flagging, okay, this crash has legs to go. You know, in March, it flagged that energy potentially has another leg up. So, you know, it's, and, and it flagged the bond crash. So it's been working extremely well this year. And I think it has been because we live in such an uncertain environment where there's just no conviction about anything, right? Like, we don't even, we're not even 100 percent sure what exactly the Fed's response function is, right? Or exactly what indicators they're looking at. This is probably the most uncertain environment investors have for anything, and so that's probably a perfectly ripe environment for these kind of social dynamic models to work, right? Where it's all about well, when one guy turns bearish, how does he affect the other guys around him? How fast do they turn bearish? And, and modeling that. So, so yeah, um, that that would kind of be my two answers: excess liquidity, medium term, short term will be LPPL. Well, John, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. But before I let you go, please tell our listeners a little bit more about what you do at Variant Perception. Uh, They do have already a sample copy of your leading indicator watch. And again, listeners, you'll find the download link in your research roundup email. Uh, For this report, for your other services, how do they find out more about your work? Um, Yeah, just go to uh, um, variantperception.com and there'll be information there. We're on Twitter. You can, you know, follow us there. Obviously, we have a blog. Um, yeah, pre- pretty straightforward. I-, I would say, you know, what we try and really focus on is quantifying things, building tools, indicators, and-, and giving you the data, right? So you can kind of make up your own mind. Well, your charts and graphs are some of the best in the industry, and I always enjoy reading your work. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right after this. After being completely sold out of advertising space for the last couple of years, we finally have capacity to add a new advertiser. Macro Voices has a PodTrack certified global audience of over 170,000 listeners, and each weekly episode typically gets 60,000 to 80,000 downloads. We have more than 20,000 accredited investors who have registered with us as accredited, and we estimate the total accredited investor audience as at least 40,000 accredited listeners, which we believe to be the highest number of accredited investor listeners of any podcast on the Internet. We strive to accept tasteful advertising from advertisers whose product is likely to appeal to our audience. So we're looking for another investment or financial services advertiser to fill the space I'm speaking in right now. Mail order Viagra salesmen need not apply. 
If your company wants to advertise on Macro Voices, please email sponsorship at macrovoices.com for more information. Now let's get right back to the show. Now back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have Tian back on the show. You know, uh, I had a feeling all along, In it's nice to see his data supporting this idea that really there isn't a lot of evidence that a recession is a great risk. I mean, it's certainly a possibility, but uh, an economic slowdown is much more realistic. It obviously could always turn into a recession, but right now, uh, just like he was pointing out, the data is not totally supporting that. Uh, what did you take away from the interview? Well, I agree with everything you just said, but with the qualifier that my view has been the Fed is going to need to engineer a recession in order to solve the inflation problem. Now, if it turns out that inflation really was transitory, it was driven by supply chain shocks because of COVID, and we're not really there yet in terms of the secular inflation that I've been expecting for years, uh, eventually. I wasn't sure when it would start. Uh, If it turns out we're not really there yet, then absolutely, it makes much more sense that this was just a mid-cycle slowdown, that's it. The thing is, if inflation is not done and uh, the Fed is is forced to continue fighting inflation. I think they do need a recession in order to fight inflation, and that would change things. But you're absolutely right that we don't know that yet. I'm speculating and um, I'm guessing in terms of that particular outlook. I agree with Tian after looking at his data that right now the data does not say recession is imminent. It says that we've got to slow down. I think it's a question of policy, and the policy is going to be determined by whether or not inflation comes under control or not. Eric, uh, all along when uh, COVID was uh, coming along, you were one of the first ones highlighting the risks of a pandemic. And uh, well, here we are now with monkeypox uh, uh, being uh, headline news. Uh, what's your take on this? And uh, what do you, do you think is as big of a deal as COVID? Well, the people who are sensationalizing monkeypox right now and saying, oh boy, here we go again, could be another pandemic, are the exact same people that were ridiculing me when I said in January of 2020, when we had Chris Martinson on the show, that it looked to me like we did have a pandemic coming. Now, of course, anything is possible, but at this juncture, I do not see any evidence to suggest that we have a certain or nearly certain or even likely pandemic on our hands. I think what's much more likely is we have a small outbreak that will be easily contained and people are just freaking out because they're afraid the last crisis is an indication of what the next crisis is going to look like. Seems to be the most commonly repeated mistake in all of finance. As far as the monkeypox virus, first of all, it is a DNA virus, not an RNA virus like SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. So as far as the fears that you see in the media about what if it mutates and there's all these mutations and all these different strains of monkeypox and they could all be coming. Those are things that happen with RNA viruses, not with DNA viruses. And if you look at the history of this monkeypox DNA virus, it's been known for a very long time that its R0 is fairly low, probably less than 1.0, which means that we really should not expect to see a problem. Well, how come suddenly there's been an outbreak? Nobody knows for sure, but the most logical hypothesis that I've heard is the combination of two different events. One was a pride festival in the Canary Islands, which was attended by something like 80,000 people. The other was a Belgian fetish festival. And although this virus is not technically a sexually transmitted disease, it is a virus which can be easily transmitted through touch and therefore sexual activity activity that occurs at fetish conferences and uh, pride festivals and so forth uh, could very easily explain the sudden outbreak that has occurred. Now, if I look at all of the evidence that I've been able to find on this and kind of bring it all together, what's the bottom line? I don't think that there is any reason for concern that monkeypox is going to turn into a global pandemic unless the virus has been genetically modified intentionally. Now, normally I'd say, well, that's a nearly impossible possibility. You know, surely it couldn't be that. 
Actually, that's not completely implausible. We know for certain that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was doing gain-of-function research. Gain-of-function research means experimenting with a virus to genetically modify it to make it more transmissible to humans. They were doing gain-of-function research on bat coronaviruses in the Wuhan labs. Now, whether or not SARS-CoV-2 resulted from a leak from that research, well, we don't know that. Probably won't be possible to ever know that for certain. But if you consider that we do know there's about 30 bio labs in Ukraine, whether or not they're doing bioweapons research or not is, uh, you know, kind of disputed by the conspiracy theory crowd. Nobody's really sure what goes on in those labs. But if they had genetically modified monkey virus in order to weaponize it, it would make perfect sense that under the threat of Russian invasion, there could have been uh, either an intentional or accidental leak of some weaponized monkey virus out of one of those laboratories. And if that happened, the people responsible for it would probably not fess up to it. Frankly, I think that's pretty far-fetched. I, I, it is a plausible explanation. So for the conspiracy-minded uh, tinfoil hat-wearing community, um, you know, that's the, the story to go with. Uh, until I see some substantial evidence that that's happening, I think what's going on here is a virus that is not a real threat is being hyped out of proportion and made to sound like a real threat by the same media that was ridiculing myself and Chris Martinson when we said back in January of 2020 that a global pandemic pandemic was probably coming. But what I do know with absolute certainty is that this week's postgame chart deck is titled What's Next for the Markets? Listeners, you'll find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com. Look for the red button that says Looking for the Downloads. Patrick, what's next for the markets? Well, uh, let's uh, start on page two with the S&P 500. And uh, one of the key things that I was uh, watching going into uh, this week was whether or not the bulls were able to get the market back above 4,000. It was a fib level off of the last sell-off and kind of a simple round number to watch for that sort of descending trend line that connected all of the uh, previous highs during the sell-off. We've been incredibly oversold and overdue for some sort of a bounce. And the fact that the market tried to break to a lower low last week and failed to follow through it has uh, potentially now sparked the beginning of some sort of a, a short-term mean reverting correction. Uh, by no means am I calling this a major market bottom or the bottom. Uh, in fact, uh, this could be something that echoes a lot, uh, maybe even a weaker version of what we saw in March, which uh, could be one of these three, four hundred. S&P point moves to the upside. Maybe we'll see uh, 4,200, 4,300 on the upside of a of a bounce. But uh, then uh, it'll be a, the real tell as to whether or not that it was just a very oversold little snapback that begins a new round of selling into the summer or whether a more meaningful bottom is in. But right now, I think that uh, we, uh, we're we overdue for, um, for a bounce and a couple hundred more S&P points are totally on the table. I agree, Patrick, and I think what will decide whether it's just a bounce and just a couple hundred more S&P points, or if we're looking at a thousand more S&P points, is going to be whether or not this idea that the Fed's hiking cycle is ending after three more hikes really turns out to be supported, or if it's just wishful thinking. I think once we get more indications on what's coming with inflation, we'll know more. Let's take a look at the Euro-US dollar cross on page three. Yeah, and what I wanted to do is focus in on the euro. Uh, and uh, one of the things to highlight is that while the US dollar did break out to a higher high uh, in the last sequence, the euro came down and traded right down to its 2017 low and bounced off of it down there just below uh, the 104 level. And so really, it was a pretty key technical support bottom uh, where we got the reactionary bounce. But that's, is again, the same story as, as we talked talked about the dollar at the uh, market wrap at the beginning. Obviously, we had a very oversold euro coming to a major support line. Typically, a reaction off of a support is a, a typical technical event. Uh, now, the real question is, uh, do the bulls have uh, more gas in the tank to be able to see the euro work its way, let's say, to 108 or 109 on the upside in the, in the coming weeks? I think uh, on the short term, the dollar uh, is uh, uh, put in a short term high in the euro 
euro is put in a short-term low. But the real question is going to come in the week or two in the, from here where we see whether or not they have follow-through after this little bounce. But moving on, Eric, I wanted to uh, move to uh, page four where we have the crude oil chart. And I specifically uh, uh, put on the July contract because when you do the continuous, it shows uh, those highs uh, from the spring that were up in the closer to $130. But when you go to the July contract, it really does look like crude oil is attempting to break out to a fresh high based on this contract. And really, we have seen very healthy accumulation, higher highs and higher lows. Only thing uh, standing in oil's way right now is that previous high. And it's going to be one of the key things to watch. If it does break out, we could really see an acceleration of the oil move to the upside. Maybe uh, at that stage, we could see 120, 125 in, uh, in week. It'll be really interesting to see whether this follow through can uh, happen today and tomorrow. Well, Patrick, as you say, the continuation chart and the contract chart look completely different right now. Normally, we don't even discuss that nuance on Macro Voices because it's kind of one of those futures traders cocktail party trivia things that nobody really cares that much about because the charts are almost the same. Now, they're not at all the same. If you look at where we are at 114 there, looks like we're almost back to that early March uh, peak again, and we're well above the peak from late March. Well, actually, on the continuation chart, we're not even back to the same level as that second peak, the one from late March. So what's the rule here? If you've got a different story being told to technicians from the contract chart versus the continuation chart, which one do you go by? The answer, as far as I can tell from quite a few years of doing this, is nobody's really sure and different people do it different ways. And what that means is that in situations like this, the market gets a little bit harder to predict because what is the, the level at which we break out to a new high? According to the contract chart, it's above 116 or so. According to the continuation chart, it's above 130, 131 in there someplace. When we get above both of those, and I think we are going above both of those, that's where you're really going to see the acceleration. But does the acceleration to the upside happen on a breakout above the previous high on the contract chart? Or do we not really get it until we get to a new high on the continuation chart? Uh, in my experience, it's really hard to predict those things. Kind of depends on the mood of the market. We'll see what happens. Well, you know, to uh, to kind of add to that, uh, I think the uh, oil traders that are actually trading the real futures are watching the July contract. So this is uh, the this price action is pretty important. I think it's it's more of the bigger macro people that are looking at those continuous charts that give you that rich uh, back history that you look for uh, uh, to do some you know uh, technical analysis over multiple years. The one interesting thing is is that when you use something like uh, the U USO ETF, which uh, tracks, um, obviously, um, there's an ETF for crude oil, but that one is actually almost uh, uh, mirroring this July contract. And we're actually approaching a fresh breakout on that USO, which obviously is a blend of uh, multiple expirations in, the, in there, as opposed to uh, rolling only that front month contract. And uh, I think, the, so a lot of technicians that are, are using real trading vehicles are going to see that break to a fresh new high. So I think that is significant. You know, that's a really important insight, Patrick, because the way the USO ETF used to work, it would have been tracking the continuation chart because they used to be almost entirely in the front month contract and they rolled it every month. Now that they've changed and it looks more like this, I think that could surprise a few people because I hadn't thought of that until you just mentioned it. So uh, now that the USO, which is driving a lot of the volume, is potentially going to give us an earlier break signal than it would have previously. Uh, I agree with you. And I also agree that most traders who uh, actively trade short term are looking at the contract chart, not at the continuation chart. So that further uh, emboldens the prediction that once we get a breakout above 116 spot, whatever it is uh, on the contract chart, the previous high from early March, that we could see some pretty significant upside. I would say, though, that there are much bigger factors than just technical analysis in play here. If we get another escalation of tension, in the Russia-Ukraine situation, that could easily skyrocket us straight up. And if we had a sudden batch of information that caused most market participants to think that a recession really was imminent, well, that could 
cause a pretty significant dip. So we'll see what happens, but I agree with you that the stage is set for an acceleration to the upside as prices continue from here. Let's move on to page five, where we've got the natural gas contract. This one, you've got the continuous contract. Right. And uh, what I want to highlight here is uh, both uh, gasoline futures and natural gas futures have uh, broken out. And that uh, can only further kind of give support to this idea that oil is capable of of making that move. I mean, we're now uh, at uh, nine plus dollars on the natural gas futures. Looks like ten dollars is imminent. And this trend is so strong. Like when you go back to May at the start of May, when we had that two day sell off, typically a market um, after that kind of a heavy technical hit would would uh, begin some sort of sustained distribution. And instead, the buy on dip traders came right in, scooped it up and took this right back to fresh new highs, just showing how strong the, the buying pressure remains in the NAC gas market. Uh, really, w- by far one of the strongest uh, uh, trends that are out there right now. Now, this is a really important one, Patrick, because it would be so tempting to say, well, look at that, $9. You know, markets always mean revert. $9, that's just way higher than we're used to seeing on natural gas. Surely it's about to come down. Here's the way you want to look at this. Natural gas prices in Europe are equivalent to more like $30, not $9. And although normally, because the transportation cost of natural gas is so much higher than crude oil, you don't really see an arbitrage of those prices. But there are several analysts that have expressed what, to my thinking, is a very credible view, which is that U.S. and European natural gas prices are going to converge over the next six months. One of the reasons is President Biden has promised the European Union that the United States will provide as much liquefied natural gas as Europe needs in order to not have to resort to buying any more gas from Russia. Well, hang on a second. President Biden made that commitment without considering a couple of minor little details, like the fact that we don't have any really substantial natural gas export terminals. We don't have enough natural gas ships in order to deliver uh, that amount of gas from the United States to Europe and so forth. So it's not going to happen right away. But I think there are a number of reasons to anticipate that natural gas is going to become much more scarce. We're eventually going to get to the point where we're not just flaring it off and wasting it. And as that happens, I think there will be a global convergence of natural gas prices. Not sure if that actually helps to bring European prices down, but I do think that it would be a mistake to think, oh, well, historically, $9 is too high. Surely it's time for this natural gas market to revert to the downside. Uh, I think they could double from here very easily. We'll see what happens before the summer is over. All right. Well, I wanted to uh, wrap up with uh, uh, looking at the charts of gold and copper. And what I wanted to simply highlight is it's really interesting that gold really uh, seems to be behaving at this moment like a cross currency to the U.S. dollar. Uh, Just as the U.S. dollar put in its short-term peak, gold uh, put in some trading low. And just as you saw on that euro chart bouncing, uh, we're seeing gold bouncing similarly. And so right now, um, it'll be interesting to see whether at some point, gold decouples from that and starts kind of marching to the beat of its own drum. But right now, uh, it really just does feel like it's one of these cross currencies against the U.S. dollar. And maybe that's the most prudent way to approach it on the short term until a catalyst emerges to, to change that market. But I wanted to also just highlight how similar copper's chart looks to gold. Uh, it had a very sharp sell-off, similar bounce off of a uh, off the, with the short-term low of the dollar. And these basic materials, really have been under a lot of pressure with obviously the risk that the econ- global economy is slowing. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see whether or not um, copper has put in the low or whether or not it can actually hold these key support lines from the 2021 lows. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we are getting a bounce off of a pretty key level. It'll be uh, interesting to see whether or not that it holds in the bigger picture. It sure will be, Patrick. And you know, it's fascinating. If you look at this chart, which goes back a couple of years now, boy, it sure looks like we just hit that low right above $4. You know, can't get all the way down to $4 because surely if you look back two years, it never goes that low. Well, it's if you go back a bit further, $4 used to be kind of the, the high that everybody assumed if it gets as high as $4, surely it won't go any higher than that. So we do have 
uh, a new regime here where what used to be the ceiling has become the floor. And I think it's going to stay the floor. So uh, if we get another test of $4, it might be tempting to buy some of those copper futures. What's even more tempting, though, is to become a member of Big Picture Trading so you can get Patrick's Chart Techs every single day of the week. You can find the information for that on page 8 or just go to bigpicturetrading.com. We're going to leave it there for this week's show. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by FarmTogether.com. Diversify your portfolio with U.S. farmland, one of the most inflation-protected and recession-resilient asset classes in the world, now available to all accredited investors. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's Research Roundup. This week, you're going to find a transcript for today's interview, as well as the uh, slide deck that Tian provided and the chart book we just discussed in our post game. There's also a number of links to articles that we found interesting. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners. And we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow me on Twitter at Patrick Ceresna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.